I love the Bible, love reading the Bible. I think many of you are here because you feel the same, love reading uh, the Bible and what God has to say. How many of you love reading the Bible when it talks about things like forgiveness? Yeah, love it. How about reading about miracles? Love reading about the miracles. How many of you love reading about slavery? Not, not so many hands, right? And we encounter slavery in the Bible. That's what we talk about this morning as we turn to Colossians 3. And it's just kind of awkward, kind of uncomfortable, right? To think, why, why is slavery in the Bible? Why doesn't God just abolish it? Why doesn't He wipe it out? Why doesn't He stop it? What's God got to say about slavery? So that's what we're looking at this morning. If your Bibles are open, I invite you just to turn there with me this morning. We'll read it quickly and then... Um, Spend the rest of our time looking at that. Colossians 3, starting at verse 22. Tyler and Michelle probably got engaged because last week I had such a great sermon on wives and husbands, right? They just thought, wow. Okay, so this week, uh, talking about slaves and masters, and uh, we'll talk about that. Verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. That's our scripture reading for this morning. So we're going to be talking about slavery, and as we do that, I need you to do something, and that is to not picture, you can go back to the previous slide for a bit, we're not going to get there for a while, thanks Rob. Uh, Rob's doing a great job this morning. Um, I need you to not picture the slave trade of the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Don't picture the transatlantic African slave trade where people were, millions of people were abducted from where they were, uh, chained, shipped over the ocean and brought to North America and other parts of the world. That's not the slavery that we see recorded in the Bible. Um, So just forget about that picture for now and we'll just focus on what we do see in the Bible and during the ancient time period that the Bible is written in. And what we see there are primarily two different types of slavery. One is economic slavery and one is military slavery. So we're going to talk about economic slavery first. Economic slavery was all about money. It all had to do with money. And today, if you want to buy a house in Vancouver, what do you do? Where do you go? Go to the bank, right? And you say, listen, I want to buy a house. I need to borrow $2 million, right? And uh, this is how I'm going to pay you back. It's going to take me 25 years and 30 years, 40 years, you're going to get your money back, right? I mean, that's how, how we buy something today. Same if you're buying a car, you'd probably talk to a bank and say, well, this is how we're going to pay you back. This is how it's all going to work out, how we're going to finance it. And if you can't do it, if you can't pay for that thing, if you default on your loan, they'll just come and take that thing back from you. They take your house back, they sell it to someone else, and they'll find some way to recoup their money, either by selling off other stuff that you own or refinancing you, or you'll have to claim bankruptcy, right? I mean, that's kind of what happens. And then there's, you know, this network of how bankruptcy protection works and all those types of things. None of that existed in the ancient world. There was no Bank of Montreal or Bank of Canada. You couldn't do that. You couldn't have insurance on a loan. And so what would happen if you needed to buy something and you didn't have the money, you'd go to a money lender. You'd go to the money lender and say, I need to borrow this much money, and if I can't pay you back, I'll be your slave. I'll work for you until it's paid off. And so in some ways, it was a voluntary slavery. You were volunteering yourself as the insurance. If I can't pay you back, I'm going to work for you till it's paid back. And so that's how lots of people ended up in slavery. Uh, We'll talk a bit about the pros and cons of that in a second, but that was one form of economic slavery. The other form was this. Uh, A famine would come or a natural disaster would come. The crops would fail. Someone would die and your source of income was gone. And so you'd go to a wealthy family and say, we'll be your slaves. We'll, we'll work for you. Just feed us, shelter us, and clothe us because we've, we've got no other opportunity. We're, we're going to die. We're starving. And so people would go and become slaves voluntarily, but out of extreme circumstances. We need this. It wasn't a house in White Rock overlooking the ocean. It wasn't steak and lobster, but what it was was life. 
being able to live. Lots of people went into slavery that way. And the challenge with both those types of slavery is that it all came down to your master. Was your master honest and fair? You, you bought something and you couldn't pay the debt back. Did they let you go, right? After five years or 10 years, did they honor the terms of your agreement? Often they wouldn't. Uh, often they would keep you. Uh, they'd keep your family. A generation after generation just being locked into this slavery, paying back a debt that was paid off uh, honestly uh, years and generations earlier. Uh, so it was one type of slavery, economic slavery. The other type was military slavery. An army would come through, they'd march through, they'd destroy a town, defeat an army, take everyone as prisoners of war, and then those people would be sold as slaves. During the Roman Empire, it was very common for slave traders just to march right behind the army and collect people as they went along and uh, chain them up and send them off to Rome, and they were slaves. That was it. They were just sold as slaves, collected as slaves. A huge, huge, huge industry. Uh, during, we don't know how many people have been in slavery throughout time, but in the Roman Empire, they estimate that around a third of all people were slaves. A huge, just this enormous group of people. At one point, the Senate there said, we should brand everyone who's a slave. Uh, we should brand them so we can look around and say, okay, these are all the slaves we've got. They didn't do that. Any guess as to why they didn't do that? It was fear. They were afraid if all the other slaves can see each other that quickly, they'll realize how many slaves there are. And there would be a revolution in a minute. You know, imagine if you thought one in every three people here was a slave, doing all the hard work, all the manual labor. They would just say, listen, let's just beat everybody up. Let's kill them. We'll be free. Let's go free. So many slaves. That wasn't a problem just for people in the Roman Empire. It was also a problem for a guy named Pharaoh as he had all these Hebrew people slaves and said, they're going to outnumber us. And, and if they rally against us, we're in trouble, right? We read about that story um, right around the time of Moses just being afraid of the slaves that they owned. Some people would ask, why didn't God just wipe out slavery? Why didn't he just one day stop it? And it's a valid question. It's totally valid. But if you think about the number of people who were slaves, imagine if God just all of a sudden stopped it somehow. And you have a third of the population with no jobs, no income, no food, no homes. I mean, it would just be chaos. It'd lead to violence and starvation and, and just, just utter chaos. And so I don't know if that's why God didn't immediately stop it at some point in history, but it, it would make sense that that would be a, an issue, a concern. How do we resolve this so that we don't create an even bigger problem? So what God did instead is he put some rules around slavery for his people, and we'll put those up on the screen now. Here's just some of the rules that are uh, given in the Bible, Old Testament rules. Slaves get one day off every week. Uh, it's a good rule. Slaves were meant to be treated as equals. We hear that in the Old and New Testament. If a slave was permanently injured, they had to be set free. There's two examples given. One, if a slave is hit and they lose an eye, their eye is damaged, that slave goes free. Uh, the other one is if a slave gets a tooth knocked out, free. I would pick the tooth if I had the option. If you killed a slave, you were punished for it. Uh, women slaves, if they were prisoners of war, were given a month to grieve before they um, were sold or married or anything like that. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, female slaves couldn't be sold. Once you had a female slave, she was yours. You, you couldn't sell her to someone else. If a man married a female slave and then divorced her, she was set free. Um, she didn't have to live in that situation anymore. If a slave wanted to stay a slave for life, they had to declare that before a judge. So you couldn't just go and say to somebody, my slave's staying for life, that's what he wants. They had to go to a judge and say, uh, I'm not being pressured into this, I love my master, uh, my family wants to stay, we're all going to stay. Right? It had to be a court decision, an official decision. Slaves who ran away because of a harsh master were free. It's a pretty interesting rule, isn't it? If they ran, they were free. If you abducted someone to be your slave or to sell them, you were killed, right? This isn't the slave trade that we're familiar with, where people were being abducted. If one of God's people stole, kidnapped somebody else, the punishment for them was death. And Hebrew slaves had to be set free after working for six years. Uh, so if uh, uh, one of God's people became a slave to another one of God's people, 
Uh, they worked for six years. At the seventh year, they were released, and that was it. Their debt was gone. They didn't owe that master anything else. These are good rules, right? I mean, it's not perfect. It's still slavery. It's still uh, serving an earthly master, but, you know, but it was God trying to put up some parameters around what slavery needed to look like if this was going to work and going to happen among God's people. What Paul talks about in the New Testament enforces this even more strongly as he writes, there's no uh, Greek, uh, there's no Gentile, there's no barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. You're all equals. And imagine reading this letter in a, the early church where there would have been slaves and masters sitting there and saying to them, you're all equal. Listen, masters, you've got a master, so be good and kind and fair. Listen, slaves, you might be a servant, a slave to someone, but you're equal. You're equal to your master. We're all equal in the eyes of of God. Earlier in Colossians 3, Paul wrote, well, that's the verse we just looked at. So Paul writes these words to us here. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. In a nutshell, Paul just says, do your best work. Do your best work all the time. Not just when you're being watched. Do your best work all the time because you're not serving your earthly master. You're serving God. Do everything like you're serving God. He talks about it another point. Maybe you'll win your master uh, to Christ, right? Maybe your boss will see you and think, uh, what's different about this servant? They're a Christian. Maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe I should believe what they believe. And your reward is coming. Your reward's coming. Don't, don't cheat. Don't lie. Don't steal from your master. And just serve him like you're serving God. And to masters, he says, masters, provide for your slaves what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Masters, don't forget that you have a master, that you'll give an account to someone as well. So be good and fair and honest to those people who work for you. What does this have to do with us, right? How does this connect to us? I don't think any of you probably have a slave at home that you're keeping secret from us. So how does this connect to us? Some people look at this and say, well, Paul's just talking about a business relationships, right? If you're an employer or an employer, this is how you should behave. There's similarities, but this is different. Um, this is different. How many of you are owned by your boss? Nobody, right? I'm, I'm, how many of you get days off? You can phone in sick, right? You take holidays. Uh, if your boss came up to you and said, okay, Cindy, thanks for doing your work. Now go scrub the toilets. You could say, I, I think someone else does that. You know, I don't think that's my job, actually, right? I mean, a slave couldn't do that. A slave just did whatever they were told. Go to the mines, go do this, go whatever it was. There's no freedom to say, no, that's not my job. So this is different. What Paul's talking about is different. But it still is true for us. As an employee, Paul's words to you are, do your best work. Do your best work all the time. doesn't matter if you have a good boss or a bad boss. Just do your best work all the time. Now work as if you're working for the Lord. And hopefully, maybe your boss will see the way that you work and hear about the gospel, know that you're a Christian, and wonder, why does this person work so happily, so diligently, so faithfully? Do your best work. It doesn't matter if you're delivering babies or flipping burgers or pumping gas. Whatever you're doing, your work matters to God. So be faithful in it. I think it's also helpful to remember that work is work. It's work. You don't go for eight hours to your workplace and have a vacation and drink a couple margaritas and then come home, right? I mean, work is work. You go there to do hard work. Sometimes we complain too much, I think, about work thinking that it should be just, you know, eight hours of partying and then we head home and then the real work starts, the laundry and the cooking and everything else. In Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve turned away from God and they sinned, God cursed some things. He cursed the serpent and promised that devil that the day would come when Jesus would come and crush his head. Uh, he cursed labor, uh, delivery, saying this is going to be hard from now on. And he also cursed physical work. He said to Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to get food from the earth. Works hard. When you go to work to pay for food and pay for your roof over your head and all those other things, 
It's work and it's hard. And sometimes we're sinful and we don't do our best. Sometimes our bosses are sinful. They don't give us the best. And sometimes it just sucks, but it's work. And so whatever the situation is, God calls us here to do our best work as if we're working for him. We all have a master. The Bible says that all of us were born in slavery to sin, and while we were in slavery, that's when Jesus came for us. That's when the master of the universe that Paul's been talking about earlier, the one who's superior and supreme in all things, that's when Jesus came, not as a master, but as a servant. Philippians 2, he writes this, that Jesus took on the form of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus came and took our place, paid the penalty that we owed, paid the debt that we couldn't pay so that we could go free. The debt of our sin was far too great for any of us to ever cover. And so Jesus paid the price for us. There's a story told of a slave girl being sold at an auction. A man buys her, pays the price, collects her, and then tells her, you're free. And she says, well, what does that mean? He says, you're free. Free to say whatever I want, she says, yes. Free to do whatever I want, yes. Free to go wherever I want to go, yes, he says. And she said, then I will go with you. Jesus comes and pays the price for us and sets us free. And then he invites us to follow him. He calls us to walk with him. He sets us free and says, you can go wherever you want to go, but but I hope that you'll come with me. Jesus has come and lived and died and rose again to set us free. We all have a master. I praise God that we know that ours is good and kind and faithful and true and that he's given himself for you to set you free from sin. There's still a lot of other masters out there. There's people who are enslaved to sin, people who are enslaved to debt, people who are enslaved to addictions, people who are enslaved to greed or lust or the appearances of things or their guilt. There's all sorts of things that enslave us. And some of us are probably still enslaved to other things. Some of us probably have that one secret we'll never tell, that one thing we still always feel guilty for no matter how many times we hear that we're forgiven. We're still enslaved to it because we haven't let Jesus set us free. Often in our world, our culture, we look back at history and say, those people were so awful, so ignorant. How could they let slavery like that happen? And the truth is, slavery still happens today. Estimates are that there's 30 million people enslaved in our world today, and it's probably more than that. Because how do you ever keep track of that? 30 million people in slavery... That's like every Canadian being in slavery. Child soldiers, slaves in mines, sex slaves, bonded slaves, slavery continues in our world. About a quarter of those, 8 million or so, are enslaved in the sex industry. Slaves are equally divided between men and women, girls and boys. About 25% of slaves, or again around 8 million, are under the age of 18. They estimate that there's 60,000 slaves in the United States, uh, mostly in the sex industry. Nearly half of all slaves, 14 million, are enslaved in India. What does the Bible say for those people, those people who are still in slavery? What does it say to us about them? I think it says, first of all, God wants them to be free, free from sin, free from death, free from the devil. That's God's primary goal, that they'd be set free for eternity from all those things. The second thing God tells us in his word is that those people are made in his image. He loves them. He made them. He knit them together. They're equal. There's no slave or free. They're they're equal in God's eyes. And thirdly, I think God says to us that we need to make sure that they're treated fairly that their masters are good and kind. And if not, then to set them free, to find some way to win their freedom. 
In another letter that Paul wrote called Philemon, Paul runs into this man who's a slave, but the slave has run away. And according to Old Testament law, this man was now a free man. He had run away from his master, and he's free. But he hears the gospel from Paul or from someone else. Here's the gospel, and Paul says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go back to your master, even though you're free. And he writes a letter to the master And he says this to him, I send him back to you no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's your equal. Treat him like your equal. And then Paul says, if he's done any wrong to you, if he owes you any debt, then I'll pay it back. Paul says, receive him back as your equal. If there's any debt owing, it's mine. Charge it to me. I'll pay it. I'll pay the debt. I'll set him free. It just echoes the words of Jesus, doesn't it, as he comes and gives himself and says, God, charge it to me. I'll pay the debt. I'll pay the price. I'll set them free. Church, I think Colossians is for us because the truth is many of us are still in slavery or we know people who are in slavery to sin and addiction and all other types of things. Colossians is for us. I think it's also for us because God has given us the call to watch over for widows and orphans and set captives free. These people are captives. And I think probably uh, on any given day, the church could rise up and pay the, the debt of those 14 million people in India. It could rise up and rally governments and officials and pass bills that could try and set those, um, those sex slaves free. I think God calls us to be their voice. It calls us to, to pay the price. It calls us to work and pray and defend those people who currently have no voice. Imagine what it would say to those people in India, I mean to the world, if we went and paid the debt of all those people and said, these people are free from now on. Or what would it say to those people caught in the sex trade if we could set them all free? And tell them, you're forgiven. What, what happened to you is terrible. You're loved. You're made in the image of God. You're valuable to Him. And He forgives you. We all serve a master. Praise God that ours is good and loving and kind and gave Himself for us. And now may we go in that freedom and help set other people free. In Jesus' name, amen.